Okay, let me ask you this simple question. How many polygons at vertices does your project have? Or more specifically, how many vertices and polygons are you currently rendering in your project in its worst case scenario? You might not know the answer right now, but for sure, at some point during your project, you will be able to answer like this. I have too many vertices and too many polygons. And this is slowing down my frame rate. Now, why is this the case? The reason is very simple. When you submit vertices and polygons to your GPU, your GPU has to transform those through vertex shaders so that they are translated from wall space into camera space or projection space. This way, your GPU will be able to continue its rendering pipeline through, for example, the rasterizer, pixels or fragment shaders, and then all this information will end up looking super sexy in your screen. So here's the key. At some point, you will say that you have too many vertices and too many polygons, and this will slow down your frame rate and your players or users will not be happy about that because your experience will look very choppy. From here, we can talk about two specific areas that matter to you. The first one is how do you diagnose whether you have too many polygons and vertices? And the second is, what do we do about that if that becomes a problem? So the first way that you have to diagnose the number of polygons and vertices is by going into play mode and checking the statistics panel here on the game window. Here, Unity will tell you how many triangles and vertices you currently have. If this is above your budget, then you will probably suffer from a lower frame rate. And every platform, of course, has different tolerances for pole count and vertex count, as you might think, right? So 1K triangles will almost never be a problem, right? No matter your target platform, unless you are targeting something like Super Nintendo or something like this. Although I think Unity does not support Super Nintendo anymore. Anyway, let's keep going. So let's assume for now that this amount of triangles or vertex count is just too high for our current target. Like I said, it is almost never the case, but let's assume just so to keep this simple. Now the question is, what can we do about this? Well, so one of the techniques that Unity offers to you is using LODs or level of detail. The principle is like this. If you are very close to your target object, let's assume it is this sphere, then you need tons of detail to represent this item or this object faithfully, okay? You are super close to that, therefore it takes out of pixels of the screen. You want to show a lot of detail about that. That might be the case for the sphere, right? And I might even argue that we are not doing very well already because you can see the edges of this sphere. In any case, when you're close to that object, or rather when this object takes out of pixels of your screen, you need a ton of detail, right? And that could be, for example, all about uh, the vertex count, right? You can have a lot of vertices and a lot of uh, materials or more expensive shaders, etc. However, when you go far away from this object, do you need that much detail? No, you don't, because you cannot even appreciate all the detail that you are rendering right now, right? So all these expensive shaders you're running for vertices and fragments and all of these polygons and vertices that you're submitting to the GPU will not matter at all when you are far away from this object. In fact, they will not only worsen your performance, it will also look worse because you cannot just display high detail when you need low detail efficiently. It's going to even look worse than if you did it the other way around, okay? So here is where the concept of LODs come into play. The idea behind LODs is quite simple. When you need a lot of detail, you show it. When you don't, then you don't. That means that if I'm very far away, I'm going to show something different than when I'm super close to this object, right? So how do we do this? Like I said, let's keep this simple. We're going to do something along these lines. When we are close to this object, we're going to show a sphere. 
when we are far away, we are going to show something like, I don't know, like a cube. Yeah? A cube has fewer vertices than a sphere. That is very clear, right? We will do this with more advanced models, but I find that doing this with uh, simpler models and simple techniques and simpler scenes helps everyone understand this technique better. So I'm going to start by duplicating this object and I'm going to call this cube. So that's what I'm going to do here, right? I'm going to change the mesh filter from a sphere to a cube. Okay. Maybe I'm going to rotate it a bit. Yeah, like that. So yeah, when I'm up close, I want to show this. When I am far away, I want to show the cube instead. How do we do this? With the LOD system that Unity offers, level of detail. Okay, so I'm going to show you the easiest way to do this. The first thing is that the LOD system has a naming convention. And the naming convention is like this. The more detail that your object has, then the closer to zero, this LOD will be, and zero is just a number. So I am going to say that the sphere is going to be LOD zero, and the cube is going to be LOD one. Of course, we could have intermediate levels, or we could even have more uh, levels at the end. That's all up to you. So how are we going to transition between these elements? Well, this is way is to select them both, and then right click and create empty parent. Here, usually we have a name for this object. Uh, let's call this, uh, I don't know, uh, character, uh, because of course it looks like a character. So now that we have this common empty parent, what I'm going to do is to add a component called LOD group. And here we need to set up the right LOD levels. So we want to have two, right? LOD zero and LOD one. I can just click with the right click mouse and their LOD2 and select delete. And then the only thing I need to do is to drag and drop the LOD levels from the hierarchy to the correct level in the LOD group component. So I just do it like this. Okay. And then let's see what happens. So if I get close to this, this will become a sphere. If I get more far away from this element, then it will become a cube. And you will notice as well that if I become, and you will notice as well that if I go super far away, it will just disappear, which is another type of LOD level, which is called cold. Okay, so basically right now we have three levels. Two real ones, LOD zero, LOD one, and then the third one, which is an implicit LOD level. Actually, it will be rather explicit, but we don't have to assign a model to that, right? So. Yeah, this is the easy way to do this. We can adjust the distances at which this transition happens by dragging this bar in between the LOD levels. So if I wanted to have the sphere most of the time, then I could do something like this, right? I could just assign a bigger portion of this bar to LOD zero. And if I wanted to show a cube most of the time, I will do that with LOD one, okay? That always depends on the size of this object in vertical means, right? In vertical pixels. But yeah, that is not really important for you to know. Just be aware that you can, you know, um, tweak the distances by doing like something like that, by dragging these bars around, okay? Now, the cool thing is that if you play this scene, you will indeed still have the 1K triangles, but if you move the camera around, it will switch to a cube, and then we will be going down from 1K approximately to 14 triangles. And that's the power of LODs. And if I went far away, it will then uh, totally drop to almost zero. So that's the power of LOD. Now, if you see this, you will be wondering, wow, that's a rough transition. It is either invisible or it suddenly pops as a cube, or when I get even close, it suddenly transforms to a sphere. Now, of course, this is a bit of an extreme example because those are not real models, right? We couldn't approximate a sphere by using a cube, okay? That would be a bit too crazy. 
but you get the idea. Especially in the last level where it is invisible and then it suddenly becomes visible, it is just rough, right? Players can tell that something suddenly up here, and this would be, you know, a very obvious thing that you would need to work on in your game in order to avoid it, right? Otherwise, your players will be a bit laughing a bit about your project, right? So what can you do about this? Well, this problem is commonly known as LOD popping. This is the rough transition between LOD levels. And many games suffer from this unless you do something explicit about this. What you can do is actually to use something called cross fading in LODs, right? You see this fade mode, you can switch it to cross fade if you want so that the transition becomes smoother. We have in general two ways of doing this. We can make this transition through semi-transparency. So instead of being alpha zero to 100 within one frame, we change this alpha or we make this object slowly less transparent over time. Or we can also use something called dithering, which is to kill a specific amount of pixels of these objects as we approach it, right? If we do this, then we have the sense of transparency and then it becomes, you know, less in your face suddenly. So we are able to uh, be a bit more sneaky about this LOD popping. Let me show you how that works. So it is sadly not enough to change the fade mode. As you are about to see, we need also custom shaders for this. So for example, if this was to work out of the box, I will just need to change the fade transition width, something like 50%. And then it will be a matter of going uh, back and forth, right? But as you see, this doesn't work out of the box. So what you need to do is to use a custom shader and a material that supports us like this, and there it is. You see this effect on the cube. This is called dithering. Some pixels are visible, some others are not. And this is pretty cool because it lets you give us smoother transition, right? So you see that as we approach the 50%, it becomes more and more opaque, let's say, right? We say 50% because this is what we set here. If I set it even up to 100, we will see that the transition takes much longer to happen or to finish, right? We will be going from zero transparency to one over a long period of time. And then it will suddenly, in our case, for our setup, become a sphere. Okay? But you can see already the benefits of using D3, right? This is much uh, smoother. It is nicer for the player. Of course, you can also do this for the other LOD level. It is just a matter of changing the fade transition width. Like I said, for this, you also need custom shaders. So you might need to know a bit of shader programming, but it is not super complicated. However, let's go to something that is more important. Let me share this with you. LODs is not only about vertex count or poly count. You can also do other tricks like to reduce draw calls. For example, let's assume that the sphere has several shaders or several materials or more complex materials. It is up to you to, you know, to come up with a use case. For me, let's do it like this for now. Let's assume that the sphere has two materials and therefore it's going to cost at least two draw calls. So if I get close to the sphere and then I enable the stats panel, we will see three patches. However, if I go far away from that, you will see that it becomes two patches. The reason is that we can have different materials and different shaders for one LOD level. For example, the LOD zero for the sphere. And then when we transition to less detailed game objects, for example, the cube, we can also have cheaper shaders and fewer materials. So yes, LODs is not only about vertex and poly count. You can also improve CPU performance by reducing draw calls. Now, this is a very simple tutorial on LODs. And for that, I have used a very simple scene, but ideally you should of course use these techniques in more advanced scenarios. So here is one example. 
here we have a scene that looks, you know, quite more complex. And when you have so many elements in a scene, then you cannot, uh, you know, maybe you cannot deal with 500k triangles. And that's even when I'm looking here at this corner, right? I'm not even looking at the rest of the scene. If that's the case, you need to use LODs. And that's the case, I assume, for this project. You see, we have tons of LOD groups. And there is nothing different in this case. It is just, you know, having several LOD levels for each of these objects. Now, you might be asking yourself, how do I generate these LOD levels? And that will be a really good question. Let's have a look at one of these. So, if you open this prefab, for example, you will notice that it has several LOD levels, LOD 2, 1, and 0, right? And if you switch up between them, you will see the difference in between the poly count, at least visually. You see this? So LOD 2 being the less detailed and LOD 0 being the more detailed. How do you create these LOD variations? Well, there are several ways to do this. And for this matter, I have put more information on this on my blog, like you can see here. So one option is to generate your LODs manually. So you might start from a high poly model or from a low poly model and then do the correct operations to come up with a specific LOD level, right? You could, for example, use the decimate modifier in Blender to simplify geometry, or you could create subdivisions to improve the detail of your model and then do modifications. This is time intensive and you need some skills. Other option is to use software that is really good at generating LODs. I listed some of them here, for example, SimpliGon and Instalot and Pixets, etc. The problem is that most of them are not that free, although they are affordable and you don't always get the optimal result. You still might need to come uh, with different workflows in order to tweak the final result. However, for programmers like me, this is super useful to have because it's going to save you quite some time and at the end of the day, you don't have to be watching tutorials on how to model and such. So if you're a programmer or you don't have artists in your team that have time for that, try this other option. And another way is to use the quick and dirty LOD generation approach that I personally use very often, which is uh, just approximating shapes with quads and planes. And you can just make screenshots out of those and use the right shaders to come up with something that is good enough when the object in question is far away enough. This works very well. And if you are interested in that, you can join the Unity Performance Task Force through the link that you have below in the description. And there you will learn how to do many advanced things like dithering and transparency based crossfading and also this quick and dirty LOD generation. Okay. If you are interested in LODs, I will suggest you to join the Unity Performance Task Force and then have a look exactly at that that video because we cover many of the advanced techniques that I don't have time for in this video. So that is it for this video. As a quick recap, Unity offers you the LOD system, LOD, LOD meaning level of detail. This lets you render high detail when you need it and low detail when you don't. And that gives you performance boosts in the areas of GPU, especially because you reduce vertex count, but it can also happen on the GPU side if you reduce the number of draw calls through cheaper materials and you know cheaper uh, shaders. On top of that, in order to avoid some of the problems with LODs, we have a crossfading, which lets you do dithering or transparency-based crossfading. That is all about making this LOD level transitions smoother. And these techniques uh, become especially important when we are talking about open worlds, okay? Because here you have a lot of visibility on a lot of objects. If you want to learn much more about LODs, if you think they can be a good fit for your project, if you think they will help you improve the performance of your game or experience, then have a look, as I said, to the Unity Performance Task Force in the third week, in the third lesson, you will learn a lot 
on how to do all of these things step by step. All right, I hope this video was useful for you. Take care and see you next time.